Like, I don't, I don't know many of you. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Ryan. I'm the, your campus pastor over at the island, okay? Journey Church has a campus over on the island. I hail from the Far East. Welcome. It's good to see you guys and those of you guys that are watching online. But I, So I don't know most of you, which is an incredibly good thing. Okay, that means we're growing. Remember, two experiences next week, 9 and 1030. Don't forget it. But listen, I believe that there's a tendency in every single one of us to control things. That, that come on, be honest. You like what you like. If you didn't like what was going on in your life, well, you would change it. You would want to have it your way. Burger King made a killing off of this slogan for a very long time. And then to take it to the next level, if you were like me, you were taught growing up that, well, to my loving father said this all the time, just control what you can control. And according to my father, that was just about everything. If you, you know, wanted to have a good job, well, you went to college, you went to the military. If you wanted to have success, you went to college, you went to the military. If you wanted to have a good wife, you went to college, or you went to the military. Like, that's not what he said about having a wife. He said, if you want to have a good wife, a little advice, gentlemen, he's like, you got to be successful, you got to be healthy, and you got to treat her the way you want to be treated. I'm doing two out of those three things really well. You can ask my wife which one I'm not doing. But here's the thing. What we were taught is that you can have whatever you want, whether it it be money, whether it be success, whether it be purpose, whether it be happiness. You can have whatever you want if you just work hard enough. And at my house, we have a saying, it's called HWBT. We stole it. I say we, because this is what my 11-year-old son is into. We stole it from a YouTuber, okay? But HWBT means hard work beats talent. And what that means is that's just shorthand for regardless of what life throws in your way, because life's going to do that. If you want it bad enough, if you just push hard enough in your own strength, you can conquer what the world has put in front of you. And, I mean, come on. There's a lot of truth in that. I mean, that's, that's the American dream. Until that dream is a nightmare. In the summer of 1993, a pudgy 10-year-old Ryan Weber was into a couple of things. I was into dinosaurs, I was into science, I was into movies. And so again, my loving father did what a loving father would do, and he took us to go see a movie that was shaping up to be not just the biggest movie of the summer or the year, but was shaping up to be the biggest movie of all time, Jurassic Park. It is not hyperbole, church, to say that everyone went and saw this movie, unless you were the outreach pastor, John Sauer, who's not here to defend himself. He hates movies, and he hates fun. He didn't see that movie. But my father took myself and my three siblings to go see this movie. Jurassic Park adjusted for inflation after not one, but two re-releases made just over $2.1 billion, just that one movie. What that means is, because when it came out, it was the biggest thing and was until a little movie called Titanic came along. But that means if you weren't Star Wars, Marvel, Disney, or James Cameron, you were not beating those monsters at the box office. And so my father took us to see the monsters. And that went about as well as you might think it would for a 10-year-old terrified of everything. I have a core memory, church, of being huddled between the seats with one finger here and the rest of my fingers there praying that they would stop the movie and let us out. I was absolutely, this is not a joke, I was absolutely convinced that they had invented dinosaurs for this movie. No joke that Jurassic Park was a documentary not a fake movie. This is a true story. It was so bad that I could not watch this movie for years to come. It fundamentally changed me. It fundamentally changed my perspective on life, on death, on going to the bathroom in tropical storms. Listen, I'm telling you, by the time I was done with this movie, dinosaurs were bad. Science was bad. Newman was bad. Everything was bad. And so years later, 
I get duped into going to see this movie on a date. We had, the, we had the coolest thing ever. We had this vintage movie theater, and it was dollar movies. And so you would go, and you'd pay a dollar to go see the movie, and then everything at the concession stands was also a dollar. I went there because that's all I could afford when I'm like 16 trying to date this girl. And so I, this girl wants to go see this movie. I take her to go see this movie, and instead of paying attention to the like, one girl in the world that agreed to hang out with me, I'm watching this movie, and I'm like, this movie's good. Like, 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 this movie is really good. This is like top three. I remember thinking this is like top three, dare I say, number one movie I had ever seen in my entire life. But it terrified me on a whole different level. And it terrified me because, well, let's talk about that. See, there was one statement that just rocked me in this movie you heard it in the clip after we played the trailer to bring back the, all the nostalgia. And it's spoken by the illustrious Jeff Goldblum playing Chaos Theory, Ian Malcolm. And he says this, he says, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, well, they didn't stop to think if they should. Now listen, that might be the most dangerous statement you hear all week. Dare I say, it might be the most dangerous statement you hear all year, and I can prove it. Because that statement lived rent-free in all the extra space I have up here since I heard it. And then just to prove to you just how dangerous that statement is, I want to incorporate a Bible story that you may or may not know. And this Bible story, I, I'll be honest, it might be top three. It might be number one most terrifying Bible stories. And because it's so terrifying, it may be why you've never heard of it. It may be why I've never heard anyone preach on it. I've certainly never preached on it. I've never heard anyone preach on it. But it also might be the most important story you hear today. Because this story could save your life. And so, well, let's talk about that too. We pick up the story in what's called Acts chapter 5. Uh, Acts is like the early Christian church. This, they weren't called Christians at the time. They were called the way. But this is just the early Christian church just trying to figure out life post-Jesus. Jesus had showed up. Jesus did Jesus things. And then Jesus died, was buried, and then he rose again on the third day. And he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father. You know the story. But there is a post-Jesus. And when Jesus left this earth... To go reign in heaven, he said, hey, I'm going to send somebody. I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to send you an advocate. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And so we pick up Acts, and it's kind of the early church just trying to figure out what this whole doing life as a Christian, or like I said, the way, what that actually looks like. And so we pick it up in Acts chapter 5, verse 1. And this is what it says. I'm going to read it right out of here. It says, but there was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife Sapphira, sold some property. He bought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. Don't miss this. The property was yours to sell or not sell, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. And as soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out back and buried him. About three hours later, making a dramatic entrance, his wife came in. Better late than never. That's mine. That's not in there. <laughs> not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, what was the price you and your husband received for your land? Or was that the price your husband received for the land? You're like, yes, she replied. That was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside that door, and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear 
rightfully so, gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Now, listen, I had the same response to watch in, I had the same response to Ananias and Sapphira as I did to the very first time I watched a guy get eaten off a toilet in Jurassic Park. <laughs> what was that? Like, what the heck is going on in this book? Now, to be perfectly clear, Ananias and Sapphira's problem was not that they weren't generous. Ananias and Sapphira's problem was not that they had held money back. It was the fact that they had allowed their coulds, they had allowed their wants of greed to blind them to the point where it was all about whether or not they could get away with it, and they forgot whether or not they should do it. Because their sin, don't miss this, their sin was lying. Their sin was lying. He said, not to us, Peter said, but you lied to God, saying that you gave the whole amount when you did it and greedily holding back some for yourselves, appearing more generous and better than you actually were. See, Ananias and Sapphira, they thought they were in charge. They thought they knew better. They thought they were in control. And you see, in, in Jurassic Park, you have, you have the, the owners and the lawyers and the investors, and you have these scientists resurrecting these dinosaurs, all the while saying something along the lines of, we know better. We're in control. I'm in charge. We don't, we don't need God. We are God. And their wants of scientific discovery and money and investments blinded them to the inherent dangers and the ethical implications of their actions. And see, we let our feelings be our guide instead of trusting the one true guide. Because how many of you know if you're running around a park with dinosaurs loose, the right guy would make all the difference in the world? You see, here's the thing. Don't miss this. Scientific discovery and monetary benefits and investments in and of themselves aren't necessarily a bad thing. Some would argue those are really good things. Some would argue those are really great things. See, selling your property and giving some of the profits to the church those aren't in and of the, that in and of itself is not a bad thing. Some would argue that's a really good thing, a great thing. But if you let your wants and you let your coulds get the best of you on a consistent basis, inevitably, unavoidably, selfishness will be your guide. And that's the wrong guide because how many of you know that selfishness is just a feeling? And how many of you know that feeling comes from the heart? How many of you know that the heart is evil above all else. It cannot be trusted. But here's the thing, church. We do this all the time in our biases. We do this all the time in our relationships. We do this all the time in our families. And then we don't get what we want because we're consistently choosing the wrong guide. But then we choose the wrong guide and then we wonder, well, that didn't work out the way I thought it would. I should do this. I'll do this in my strength. I can handle this. And we trust our feelings and our judgment and our wants and our coulds. See, we harbor on the could so often that it leads us to lie and steal and cheat our way to serve our purpose and to serve our wants. But here's the kicker. We do it the whole time and we go, it's okay because I thought this through. It's okay because I'm in control. It's okay because, well, I know what's best for me. The problem is, church, if your moral or even your spiritual GPS is off just a little bit, you're going to find yourself in a tropical storm with your Jeep stuck in the mud, spinning your wheels. Instead of thinking about what you should have been thinking about, you're thinking about whether I could make it to the boat, whether I could steal these things. Instead of thinking about what you should be thinking about, which is a pint-sized killing spitting machine dinosaur that's trying to eat you. What you do is you find yourself at a destination that you never intended going, doing and facing a reality that has the potential to cost you everything. Now, listen, I'm not saying you're going to get eaten by a dinosaur because they're real. Jurassic Park. <laughs> I'm not saying you're going to get buried out back with your spouse. What it's probably more going to look like for you is that yourself and those that you really care about around you that are caught up in the shrapnel of your life exploding, of your moral and spiritual GPS being a little bit off, 
suffering unnecessarily. Because here's the thing, you thought you'd be the exception to the rule. You did. You thought you knew better. You thought you wouldn't get caught. You thought you wouldn't fail like all those other people had failed before you. But here you are thinking, doing, and saying things that you never imagined. And then to make matters worse, come on, come on, where where are my Christians? I'm going to pick on the Christians for a little bit. If you're not a Christian and you're here, man, welcome. I am so glad that you are here. You get to kind of just see what the expectations are about being buried out back. Listen, like... (laughs) Man, I am glad you're here, but I'm not going to pick on you. I want to pick on the Christians for a little bit because as Christians, what do we do when we get find ourselves stuck? Well, we double down. We're going to do it in my strength. And we put ourselves at the center of the struggle. And then we think no one else can help. What we're doing is we're introducing our pride into an equation that does not need our pride. And we're going to be in control. And then we try to talk about our status and what the world says about that. And come on, we try to... Com- control the narrative because we're about control and what we've done is we've lost our context see in our selfish ambition and our greed we we have failed to realize that we are not in charge that you don't know better that you're not the exception to the rule you can't handle it and we ignore the reality of our own limitations and we let our wants and our coulds whether we could get away with it run free and as a result We forget our context. We forget just how powerful God is. We make ourselves the main character, and you are not the main character. One of the main characters from Jurassic Park, towards the end, after all dinosaur heck is broken loose, says, you know, I got to be honest. Kind of this is an introspective moment. She says, like, even I got caught up in the wonder of this place. And the power of this place and what's going on around me. So much so that I forgot about the dangers of this place. We become so enamored with our lives and what we've done that we forget that we are not the power behind it. We have forgotten just who is. And the consequences of making that decision. See, we forget that it's his power to be our guide, forgetting that we aren't God and the consequences of that can be devastating. So it begs the question, what do you do? What do you do when you find yourself stuck in a tropical storm? Life has found a way. Newman has found a way. Monday has happened. Your job or lack thereof has happened. Your greed has happened. Your unwillingness to surrender control has happened. Ananias and Sapphira has happened. What do you do? Well, the first thing that you need to do is realize the difference between success and failure, both in this life and leading into the next. See, the difference between success and failure for Ananias and Sapphira came to one very simple thing. It's something that you and I forget far too often. See, this one thing, the lack of this one thing, derails more success stories. It derails more marriages. It derails more relationships. This one, this lack of one thing causes a slowdown when it comes to learning and growth, both personal and spiritual, more than just about anything else. This lack of one thing keeps more people, more organizations, more churches, and more Christians from experiencing God's best than just about everything else. And that one thing is humility. Church, the, the Jurassic Park trailer was longer than it took me to read about Ananias and Sapphira. We don't get much about Ananias and Sapphira on the pages of history. I don't know whether they were good people outside of this. I like to think that they weren't just based on what I got, probably not awesome, but I don't know. They might have been awesome. But I can tell you what they didn't have. Humility. I know that they thought they knew better. I know that they thought they were in control. I know they were worried about what the world thought and appearing more generous and appearing more godly and appearing more lovely than they actually were. I know that they thought and liked money more than they liked truth. 
But you know what the worst part about Ananias and Sapphira is? Can I just be like real with you for just a moment? The worst part about Ananias and Sapphira is I see a lot of me in Ananias and Sapphira. I see a lot of wanting to control everything. I see a lot of I want to be in charge. I want to see a lot of, I, I see a lot of like, I'm going to do this in my own strength. I'm going to do this in my own will. I see a lot of, I'm worried about what the world thinks and controlling the narrative. I see a lot of, I think I know better. And it happens quick. It happens quick when we build our foundation on the world and of worldly things. See, Peter was right. And Peter's talking to him, I love Peter in this story. He says, the property was yours to do as you please. The money was yours to do as you please. Your life is yours to do as you please. It's the perks of free will. It's the God-given gift that he gave you, free will. However, Ananias and Sapphira's downfall, our downfall is our inability to surrender and not be in control. You had these people in Jurassic Park grasping for God-like power instead of surrendering to the one who actually has God-like power because he is God. But it's easy to get there. See, Ananias and Sapphira's lack of morality and their propensity for lying and their propensity for not trusting God in all the matters, even, even the touchy ones like money, well, it led to their destruction. But here's the, here's the deal. I mean, listen, I don't think, I don't think, I don't know you, but I don't think most of you set out to lie and cheat and steal your way into an early grave. They were just focused on whether or not they could instead of, well, whether or not they should. And they let their feelings lead the charge instead of building their lives on the power and presence of God. They built it on their wants. Right? They just wanted to blow everybody away with their generosity. And they wanted, I, I'm just imagining, they wanted to just look how awesome we are and all that we sold our property and we gave you all of it. Look at how good I am. Right? The power of that. Just like the power of a park off the coast of Costa Rica. But instead of doing that, what we should be doing is pointing and just saying, look at how awesome God is. Look at the power that God has. And so we, we become so preoccupied with whether or not we could, we don't stop to think if we should. And to be perfectly honest with you Christians, we do it the most. We do it the most. I wonder if I could get away with it and the people at church would know. I wonder if I just sidestepped a little bit of morality when it came to my business, if they would know. They would find out. I don't think they would. I think I could do it. Instead of thinking about whether you should do it. But we make it worse, Christians. Can I be honest with you? We make it so much worse. Because we, we, we began in such a beautiful place when it came to our walk and our journey with Jesus. I want you to close your eyes just for a moment. I want you to think back think back to that first moment. I'm just picking on the Christians. I want you to think back to that first moment, that, that beautiful, lovely moment when you said yes to Jesus. Oh man, just think about it. How good and wonderful it felt and how, how you felt safe and secure and protected and it didn't matter in that moment what life was going to throw at you because you knew you had Jesus. Now, open your eyes. And I want you to think back to the moment when you first thought, look at how good I am. Look at how far I've come. Look at all that I have done since I became a Christian. I'm the best Christian I know. I've sinned the least. I don't even know if I've sinned since I said yes to Jesus. Look at how good I am. <laughs> and we fall victim to the temptation to play God and to be in control. And we forget the consequences of doing just that. It's Jurassic Park unfolding in your life in real time every time you try to upsert the role of creator. 
I can't help but think when James, James was the half-brother of Jesus, I can't help but think, James wrote the book of James, and we, we're going to talk about James chapter 4 here just for a little bit. But I can't help but think when James wrote James chapter 4, he didn't call it chapter 4 because he just wrote. But we call it chapter 4 because we need help in organizing things. But James is like, James is like the Proverbs of the New Testament. And James, it's just so practical, so good. James, to be perfectly honest with you, James is the reason I believe in the Bible. It really is. Because James was the half-brother of Jesus. You know why I believe James? What would it take for you to convince your siblings you were God? <laughs> James knew Jesus was God. James is in, I'm in, Right? So James is, is writing, I can't help but think, James is thinking of Ananias and Sapphira when he writes this warning in what we call James chapter 4. And this is what he says. He said, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. See, when we focus on the coulds instead of God's shoulds, we risk distancing ourselves from God. We were distancing ourselves from God's guidance and protection. Because what we've done is we've introduced pride into the equation that never belonged there. But here's the thing. Do you know what the opposite of pride is? Humility. But pride blinds us to the consequences that we never saw coming. But James continues. Watch what happens. Wow. Watch what happens when James introduces humility into the equation. Because, man, this is too good. So James chapter 4 says this. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands you sinners. Not if you sin, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. And then he repeats himself. Anytime the Bible repeats himself, you poor, you should pay attention. It says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. Don't miss this. As you humble yourself before God, something beautiful happens. Something, something incredibly lovely happens. Because God promises a few things, and a few things become to happen. There's sort of a, a just a, again, a, a lovely natural progression to it. So as you humble yourself before God, you begin to resist the devil, which you don't even have to be a Christian. If there's a devil, and I believe that there is, if there's a devil, guess what? That devil now flees from you. You don't have to be a Christian to want the devil, if he exists, to flee from you. I don't know about anybody that sets out and be like, you know what I hope happens today? I hope the devil comes closer to me. I hope he has more influence in my life. No, he says, humble yourself before the Lord because you're going to resist the devil. And when you do that, the devil is going to flee from you. Your ability to resist the world, to resist the coulds, to resist the wants, and instead focus in on God begins to change. And it forces the devil out of the one place that he really wants to be. Your mind. But it gets better. He says, when you do that, you're now going to step closer to God. Inevitably, unavoidably, you are resisting the devil, and so you are stepping yourself closer to God. And if that's not enough, God, who's looking out and says, there's my prodigal son, there's the one I want, man, there's the one I have been, I just can't wait. He says, you know what, I'm not going to wait. I'm going to move closer to you. Again, I don't know anybody under the sound of my voice, whether you believe in God or not, and I do, that if there's a God, you would want him on your side. That you would want him to move closer to you. See, the people clapping right now are the people that know. The people know what it means to have a God move close to you. And you needed to take those steps because your loyalty was stuck in a place somewhere between the world and somewhere between God. 
your world was full of a bunch of coulds. See, the world is full, the world is full of temptations. See, instead of focusing on the one who could actually be your guide and your protection, we focus in on the world. See, instead of focusing on the one that could actually purify your heart, did you notice what it said? It said that if you wash your hands, that, is, that word for wash is so much bigger than just like I put some hand sanitizer on it as I went through the door. No, that word for wash is to cleanse, to cleanse on a soul level. See, when you do that, it says the Lord will lift you up in honor. So you want the devil to flee your life? Humble yourself before the Lord. You want to draw near to God and resist the devil? Humble yourself before the Lord. You want that miracle to happen in your life? It starts when you humble yourself before the Lord. You've lost hope in your life. You just need to humble yourself before the Lord. Listen, you feel stuck in your job, stuck in your family, stuck in your relationships, D, all of the above. You just need to humble yourself before the Lord. That's the place to start. When something doesn't feel right in your life, you just need to humble yourself before the Lord. When you want to quit, when you want to come down and you're just done with it, whatever it is in your life, you got to humble yourself before the Lord. Man, you got... You want to overcome? You can't do it in your power. If you could, you would have already done it. Humble yourself before the Lord. You can't go on. You need to humble yourself before the Lord. See, all along you've been so worried about what the world thinks instead of worrying about what God thinks. So how do you humble yourself? What does that actually look like? Well, it starts with realizing that you're not in control and you never were. That if you would just put your coulds on the back burner and focus on whether or not God thinks you should, you'd be in a much better place because now you're resisting the devil. You see the natural progression, but you've been so preoccupied with what the world thinks. You've been trying to fool the world. The world knows better, just a heads up. You've been trying to fool the world to thinking that you're better, more holy, more godly than you actually are. And because you did that, because I do that, you end up like Ananias and Sapphira, dead in your relationships, dead in your career, dead in your finances, dead in your growth, dead in your spiritual walk with your heavenly Father who loves you so much to point it out to you. See, for my non-Christians in the room, can I just be honest with you? They're, you're doing something. You might not even know that you're doing it. You're trying to find peace and joy in the things of this world. And for some reason, it's just not working. But see, for the Christians that I picked on so much today, listen, we don't find peace and joy and love and mercy and grace in the things of this world. No, what do we do? Well, we find it in the only one that can provide those things, Jesus. But it takes us surrendering our control. But don't miss this. Daily. This is not a Sunday morning thing. This is not a Wednesday night thing. This is not a, I walked an aisle or got dunked in a baptismal six years ago, so I'm good. I've surrendered. No, this is a daily thing. And when you do that daily, watch the natural progression. Now your life begins to reflect humility. And now your life begins to reflect obedience to the only one worth being obedient to. And it's tough. It's tough. Listen, it's real tough. Because the immediate difference in your life when you follow Jesus may not be obvious. But just know that there is an eternal work going on inside of you via the power of the helper we talked about at the beginning, via the power of the advocate that took up residence in you when you said yes to Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, your coulds and your shoulds start to look a whole lot different. Instead of focusing on the things of the world, you focus on the things that are eternal. And so, resist the devil. Oh, resist the devil. He's, he's going to flee from you if you do. 
And when you do, you're going to take step after step after step after step after step towards a loving heavenly father. But that father is running to you saying, man, I've missed you. Man, I'm so glad you have decided to come back to me. The one that can actually provide you with protection. The one that can actually provide you with everything you need. Resist the devil so he'll flee from you so that you'll draw close to God so that your hands and your soul will be washed and purified. If you could have done it, you'd have already done it, but you couldn't, which is why you needed Jesus what that does is that causes your loyalty to no longer be in the things of the world, but it causes you to be in the things of God. And when you do that, church, watch, watch as God comes through on his promise to lift you up and to honor you in ways you never dreamed possible. Church, will you bow your heads with me as I pray over you as we finish out today? God, I am so thankful for everything that you have done. Oh, God, I, I'm so thankful for your provision. I'm so thankful for your protection. God, I'm so thankful for just who you are. God, thank you for drawing near to us being a God of relationships that I can, I, can, I, can, I can pray and talk to my creator. Are you kidding me? So God, I thank you for that. I thank you for reminding us daily to humble ourselves before you because what's best for us is more of you. But God, above all else, God, I thank you for your, sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross, to wash us, on a soul level, to make us right in your eyes, to make us righteous, if we would just believe in him. Thank you for sending your son, a savior to us. God, I love you, and I thank you. It's in that precious name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.